meeting, Dr. James uh, Lambsdale of West Virginia University. Uh, he studies Paleozoic arthropods, um, things like horseshoe creds and their relatives. He uh, recently published on the fauna of the Artibician Big Hill Lagostat in Upper Michigan. Uh, and no further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker. It's all yours, James. Hi, excellent, thank you. Okay, I'm going to um, share this screen here. Okay, can you all see this? Yes. Excellent. Yes, okay. I can see it. Excellent. Um, so yeah, I just thought uh, what I'd do is um, sort of tell you a bit about the work that uh, we've been doing uh, at Big Hill and uh, the various critters that we've been getting out of it, um, with a particular focus on the arthropods, of course, um, and what some of these arthropods are telling us about uh, the relationships in the early evolution of uh, the chalicerates, which are um, our modern arachnids um, and horseshoe crabs, but also uh, a couple of interesting uh, extinct groups. So before I get into it in full, um, I have uh, just a couple of uh, acknowledgements, um, uh, particularly my uh, co-workers and, and co-collectors, uh, Ron Meyer uh, and Jerry Gunderson, who sadly um, passed away at the start of this year, um, both of whom uh, have actively been collecting the site, who discovered it, um, and have been really great for working with me in, in sort of putting this all in context and uh, sort of passing on uh, some of the, the best specimens um, for accession so that we can um, publish on them. Uh, Dr. Carrie Eaton, who is the uh, collections manager and curator at uh, um, uh, the Geological Museum in Wisconsin, uh, who has been dealing with me, constantly requesting material and photographs. Uh, and then various co-authors who um, have worked with me on some of this material, particularly uh, Derek Briggs, Steve Leduca, uh, Melanie Hopkins, um, and then uh, Lorenzo Prendini and Maggie Rubin, who were involved in um, one of the studies I'm going to show you, looking particularly at cuticle. So I'm sure you're all familiar with um, Lagerstadt uh, and what they are. These are exceptional sites of uh, amazing preservation that uh, really give us a good view of uh, the full breadth of what was around at particular periods of time. And of course, the most famous um, large stone are all in the Cambrian, uh, particularly uh, Burgess Shale um, and Chen Zhang and uh, Sirius Passet and uh, the Weeks Formation too. Uh, but as we've got uh, further and further um, into um, studying some of the more obscure sort of outcrops um, of the Ordovician rocks, we began to uncover more and more Ordovician Lagerstatt as well. Um, so there are quite a few from the upper Ordovician, particularly Sum Shale in the Hanantian, um, Airport Cove and William Lake, which I'll um, talk a little bit about in a second. Uh, Winnesheek, which I like because it's got uh, some of the oldest preserved uh, Eurypterids. Um, which is uh, a, cool, a cool locality found in uh, a basically a, a meteorite crater that's been flooded um, in Iowa. And uh, the, the fun thing about that is that all the Eurypterids are preserved as this carbonaceous cuticle. Uh, and back before they knew what it was, they thought it was plant material. So they were ashing it to try to work out how much, what the carbon content was. So I don't know how many Eurypterids they burnt, but it's quite a few. Um, and then the Fezoata which is probably the most famous. Uh, in fact, Fezoata is so important from uh, a sort of Paleozoic Lagerstatt perspective that all the other Ordovician Lagerstatt tend to get pushed by the wayside. Um, uh, and then of course, not even appearing on this uh, figure here is Big Hill, which is a relatively small um, and depauperate uh, Lagerstatt, but I think it's quite cool. Uh, and there are some really important things uh, that it shows us. Uh, now, when we look at um, Big Hill and the uh, its sort of location, there's a series of other um, upper Ordovician Lagerstatt that it really sort of uh, draws comparison to. Uh, and these are the uh, Canadian uh, Cassian Lagerstatt that are um, sort of arrayed from Cathead all the way up to Airport Cove. 
Uh, and so this is their sort of uh, paleo geographic position. And this is where Big Hill sits. So these are all vaguely contemporaneous. They all were deposited around the same time. But uh, Airport Cove and William Lake and Cathead all up on this side of the landmass. And Big Hill is down on this side, just on the edges of the Michigan Basin. Uh, and these Canadian large Stratton have had quite a bit of work done on them. Um, and they show a sort of odd Ordovician fauna that you're going to see is very, very similar to what we see at Big Hill. Uh, so from William Lake, we've got a series of uh, Medusa uh, and other jellyfish type creatures uh, and a bunch of arthropods. Um, we've got some horseshoe crabs, the currently oldest described horseshoe crabs. This weird creature, which I'll um, talk about at the very end of what I'm going to be showing you, uh, this is interpreted as a pycnogonid or sea spider. These are another group of aquatic chalicerates uh, that are really weird arthropods. They've reduced their bodies down to nothing. So they're literally just heads um, and their guts are like pushed into their legs. They've just basically crammed everything into as small a space as possible. Uh, and so finding out what these used to look like before their weird spindly selves uh, today is, is always interesting. Uh, and these uh, creatures, which were interpreted when they were first found as Eurypterids. Uh, Airport Cove uh, is uh, fairly similar, perhaps um, slightly shallower waters. Um, we still have the horseshoe crabs. Um, we have these Eurypterid and Eurypterid-like creatures, but there's also lots of algae. Uh, and then cat head is uh, a bit different. It's been interpreted as being maybe um, some deeper waters. Uh, you get trilobites, um, there's um, sponges, as well as various algae, which may be either growing there or have been uh, washed out to sea from um, closer to shore. And uh, a series of uh, cnidarians as well. So um, big, heavily uh, sort of constructed jellyfish-like creatures that probably were sitting attached. Um, or just sitting on the sea floor. Uh, so when we first were looking at um, the Big Hill, actually, um, Ron and Jerry approached uh, Dave Rudkin and uh, the others that were working on uh, these Canadian um, Lager Stratton and said, basically, we found another one. Uh, and they were so busy with everything we've got in Canada that they weren't particularly interested, which was good for me, because they came to me and uh, we were able to start looking at this interesting material. Uh, and so here you can see a, a sort of sample of what we have from uh, Big Hill. It, it's an interesting mixture of uh, basically all three of um, the Canadian localities. Uh, we have a series of uh, algae. Uh, we have uh, Medusa, Medusoid jellyfish. Um, we have um, some chalicerate eurypterid like arthropods. Here's some more appendages. Um, we've also got what we first interpreted as weird chitinous tubes, although I'm now fairly certain that these are just badly preserved uh, orthocone nautiloids. Um, various um, brachiopods uh, and bivalves and the like, um, and uh, this weird arthropod, which again I'll get to talk about a little later on. And the way these are uh, preserved is the majority of what we're finding at uh, Big Hill is uh, dolomite. And then in between um, these basically blocks of dolomite, we have thin layers of gray um, siltstone. Uh, and what we're thinking is happening is we're finding these on the tops of the dolomite where they're covered by silt. And what's probably happening is we're getting um, either some sort of storm deposit or, or something like that is dredging up finer sediments and um, basically pushing it all into what would have been a, a sheltered lagoon. And so we're getting these preserved where they've been rapidly buried by this silt, and that's what's preserving them. And in fact, um, a number of these um, arthropod uh, fossils, which are probably um, shed exoskeletons, are relatively three-dimensional because all the silt's been pushed inside the empty exoskeleton as well. So we're seeing um, a bit more three-dimensionality. We can get some really very interesting bits of um, their anatomy preserved in um, relation to one another that we haven't been getting elsewhere. Um, and so what we think is going on is that this is a, uh, a sheltered lagoon in relatively marginal marine environments, which is why it, it looks sort of depauperate and different to what we're seeing in, in a lot of the more open marine Ordovician uh, localities. 
Uh, and we're getting a lot of arthropods because they, at least these ones, seem to be going into this environment to uh, shed their exoskeletons. So it's a sort of a sheltered area for them to go in um, during what is really a very vulnerable part of their lives when they shed their exoskeletons. It takes a lot of energy. Um, you regularly get arthropods will sort of die during the process of molting or soon afterwards. Uh, and then they are just exhausted and then they have to harden their uh, new exoskeleton as well. So they're very, very vulnerable. And so all of these specimens come from one of two quarries. Um, one of the quarries is in um, a state forest um, land and is pretty much sort of inaccessible because of that. Uh, the other one is located on municipal land for the local township that Ron and Jerry um, sort of negotiated access to. Uh, and so this is what these, uh, this quarry looks like. And so here you can see just the, uh, the, the dolomite and it's just in these slabs. And you can kind of see in between um, these blocks, you have this very uneven surface. Uh, and this is because where you've got this break in dolomitic deposition and you've got um, this uh, fine siltstone, which is mostly weathered away here. You can sort of see bits of it falling out here. It's all this uneven topology. And so we're probably getting a bit of the original seafloor uh, preserved here. Uh, and where they, the uh, fossils being preserved are very similar to the windrows that you get uh, in the Bertie. Uh, and so you get these little troughs um, where stuff's been accumulated by these storm events. Um, and then when you sort of find them, you can pop them out and you'll find lots of fossils in a sort of very limited area. Uh, and so what I'm going to do now is just go through and show some of the, the, the specimens we've got because we're getting some really amazing details um, out of these things. Uh, so we have these are some of the um, rarer things. We actually have one trilobite from one area. We think this is uh, maybe an isotelid of some form. As you can see, we have not most of it, um, but you can clearly make out the, the sort of trilobite segments. Uh, and then this is one end of it, um, probably the head shield, but it's difficult to say. Um, we also have a few rare sponges um, and some rare bryozoans. Uh, so we do know that there was um, a, a community living, um, a sessile community that was not moving in and out of this lagoon that was around most of the time. Uh, the two most common things that we find uh, here are the brachiopods. Uh, and so we have two forms. We have um, a, a sort of dissonant looking form uh, and a lingulid looking form. Uh, we haven't done much work on these, but uh, they really are everywhere. Um, you can actually can find them, um, dozens of them, just around uh, some of the arthropod fossils. Um, so they're just sort of covering the place. Uh, and then we have lots of uh, algae, which Steve Laduca wrote up um, a couple of years ago. Um, and so we've got these more, these really, what I think are really cool looking, almost horsetail like things. Um, and then we have some more like filamentous, like blobby type uh, algal forms. Uh, but these are very, very common as well. Um, and we're actually getting um, sort of vaguely carbonaceous preservation of these. So we're getting some real exceptional preservation out of this. We also get uh, a variety of, of mollusks. Uh, so we have some gastropods, not commonly preserved, but occasionally we do get these uh, sort of spired or turreted forms. Um, which are uh, kind of cool to find. I do get the impression that the um, shell of these things is, is being um, somewhat dissolved away, um, potentially related to the dolomitic pres um, preservation, I'm not sure. But we often will get blobs that we think were probably at one point a snail or a bivalve, but there's just not much uh, being preserved. What we do get a number of are these orthocones. Uh, and these are cool because you get some organic material, you can just about see um, here, some of this organic material running down the center of it. Uh, and these are probably all the same species. We suspect these are empty, empty cones that are getting um, swept in or pushed in during the storm events and then sort of accumulating within the lagoon. 
Uh, and so uh, this is one where you can sort of see the individual chambers. And this is one of these things that we originally called some kind of chitinous tube, uh, that having seen this type of preservation elsewhere, I suspect this is now just a badly preserved um, nautiloid. Uh, we have the uh, sort of more of the actual shell preserved. And then what I thought at first might have been some kind of stalk, I suspect is this circuncular chamber running down that's been, been preserved. So we're getting some variation of preservation um, with these things as well. We also have um, a large number of medusoids. Uh, and I've talked to Derek about these and he's, he thinks they will conquer peltis. And so conquer peltis is what, uh, one of these interesting uh, forms with a slightly more sclerotized uh, structure within the, the bell and it would have sat upside down and just filter fed. Um, on uh, the sea floor. So we have dozens of these things and they're in various stages of decomposition as well. So some of them, uh, you can get sensors of the internal structures. You can see sort of these, these concentric rings here. Um, and some of them you can actually see just about striations of, of maybe um, whatever passes for muscle in these things. Uh, but in other forms, they're just these slightly discolored blobs. Uh, so it's it's possible that we have a mixture of ones that are alive when they're buried and others that have died and are now um, being um, uh, through various stages of decay when they've been um, buried and smothered by uh, the sediment. But the thing that I think makes Big Hill really interesting is the diversity of the arthropods um, that we have there. Uh, and so this is uh, a phylogeny showing um, each of the major uh, calicerate groups. And so here are your arachnids at the top, um, your scorpions and your pygids and the like. These are the erythrids, which I have done um, quite a bit of work on. So these are quite diverse um, aquatic forms. There's about 250 species known. Um, they, they range from the Ordovician through to the end of the Permian. Uh, and then we've got our Ziphyrsurans down here, which are, are not well represented on this tree, but these are our modern horseshoe crabs and their relatives. Um, and here are the Pycnogonids, these weird, very reduced um, body forms with their long spindly legs and they're not much else. Uh, and then there's a weird, a little group here, which not many people know about called Chasmataspidids. Uh, and at Big Hill, we actually have all three of the non uh, Pycnogonid uh, aquatic calicerates represented. So we have uh, Eurypterids, which you can see the appendage, some of the appendages of up here. Um, we have uh, some horseshoe crabs, which aren't in this figure because we found them after we published the initial paper. And then we have these things are actually uh, Chasmataspidids. Uh, and this is the, the one arthropod that we've got written up so far. It's because we have about 50 specimens of it. Uh, and for a Chasmataspidid, it's actually incredibly bizarre. And so chasmataspidids are a group of predominantly small arthropods. Um, we have, uh, I think there are about a dozen species known. Uh, half of them were described in the last 10 years. So um, the first ones were, the first one chasmataspidus was described in 1954. Uh, and then for the next uh, 50 years, we only found another three or four. Uh, and then in the last 10 years or so, we've, we've doubled the number that we know. Uh, and they're a, a, a sort of a weird group. They've been considered to be either related to Eurypterids or related to horseshoe crabs, or maybe um, split between both of them. Uh, this is Chasmataspis, which is the first one uh, described. It's got what we call a buckler. So it's got a, a bunch of fused segments after the head, uh, which was considered very, very similar to the fused up body of the horseshoe crabs. Uh, but it's got uh, more body segments afterwards. So it's got um, a long sort of flexible body and then the tail spine at the end. And then these on either side are uh, members of uh, the group within Chasmataspidids that we call Diploaspids. Uh, and the interesting thing about these is that uh, they are very much smaller than Chasmataspis. So Chasmataspis can get up to be about 10 centimeters long, uh, which isn't bad for uh, a calicerate, most calicerates are, are not that big. 
Uh, and then these are, are fairly average sizes for, for diploaspids, uh, and these can get to be out two centimeters long at maximum. So we have, um, this is the only, or this was the only order vision form new, known, and it was quite large and very horseshoe crab-like. And then these are Silurian and Devonian forms, and they're very, very small and much more Eurypterid-like. Uh, and based off the limbs, we knew that these ones had paddles. Uh, and then the, the, the interesting thing is that um, Chasmataspis, as well as looking much more horseshoe crab-like in terms of its body shape, the limbs are also much more horseshoe crab-like. So the limbs are all chelate, so they end in just a pair of pincers. Uh, they're not very well known, so this is the only example that we have, and they're disarticulated, but they are found in association um, with these original specimens. Uh, and so this was considered really, really horseshoe crab-like. It's very large. Uh, and so how you get from there to the Diploaspis-like ones that are much younger was a bit of a mystery. Uh, and we have about 12 specimens of, of Chasmataspis known. We have very few specimens known for the majority of other Chasmataspids. Uh, so here's uh, Diploaspis, which is from the Devonian of Germany. Uh, this picture is awful, but the material uh, is not much better in real life. It's um, this dark sort of vaguely reflective um, cuticle that is preserved, smashed up amongst plant matter um, in these very dark uh, Devonian rocks. And so it's almost impossible to photograph. And it's also absolutely tiny. So you've got to look at it under the microscope. Uh, but people have found appendages with these things. There's, there's maybe about 20 specimens of these. Um, and the appendages look much, much more Eurypterid-like. They're not chelate, they end in just sort of a normal sort of walking limb. And at the back, they have paddles. Uh, and then when we found uh, some more species, um, we found more and more characteristics that began to link these or make these look similar to the Eurypterids. Um, so in 2002, um, uh, about 20 specimens of, of this uh, species, October aspis, um, were described. Uh, and the thing that's interesting about this is, as well as preserving um, a number of appendages, you can kind of see up here some of them, uh, and you can see that the, it's reconstructed with a paddle as well. So we know that this had a paddle at the back. Um, it has um, a gentle appendage, which was considered to be a, a characteristic that only Eurypterids had. Uh, and also it's got a, a metastoma, which is a plate that sits just behind the mouth. It's used to help sort of grind up food and push it into the mouth. That was another characteristic that only Eurypterids were thought to have. So the more we found out about these things, the more we began to think that chasmataspidids maybe aren't a real, a natural group at all, that maybe chasmataspis belongs with horseshoe crabs and these all belong with Eurypterids. Uh, and so it was very exciting for me when I came to look at what I thought was a Eurypterid and immediately began to see traits that looked uh, very much like a Chasmataspidid to me. Uh, and so the thing that really tipped me off um, was when I found these specimens here. Uh, and the, as I said, Chasmataspidids have a fused up um, series of plates at the front, just behind the head. And so the first uh, there's a small uh, body segment and then another three, and these are all fused together. And you can't always tell from the top, but from the underside, you can see it's a single plate. And so we've got one here preserved um, laterally, so you can see the side. And here you can see the fused plate on the underneath. And here you can see uh, the uh, three segments at the top and the small segment just behind the head. So I saw this and immediately began to think that these were potentially something very, very exciting. Um, because if these were chasmataspidids, it's only the second one that we know from the Ordovician. And these are huge. Uh, these things could go up to about 20 centimeters um, long. So these would have been gigantic um, for chasmataspidids. Uh, here's another specimen from the top showing um, again the single fused plate where it's broken away and then on the on the other side here you can just see the edges of where we can see the segments that are on top so again we can see that this was a fused um, plate and then it's got the rest of its body all sticking out the back here so the other thing that's really exciting about this is we have a really good view of what the appendages are doing 
And so we can see that this one also had a paddle uh, and we can see really good views of what the uh, rest of the head appendages look like. Uh, and to be honest, this thing was terrifying because it's got each one of its um, leg segments has just got this gigantic spine that's almost the length of the rest of the legs sticking out of it. So this thing was a, probably a really voracious predator. Uh, and so it, it looks like it's doing something very, very different to what the other uh, chasmataspidids are doing. It's a big predator. You can see it's got really big eyes and they're forward facing um, and probably had some degree of overlapping field of vision at, at a, a bit of a way ahead of it. So it's probably lining up its shots long in advance of where, you know, when it got there. Um, but this does have the hallmarks of a predator, much more like we are used to seeing in Euryptrids than we're seeing in Chasmataspidids. The other interesting thing is when I saw this, I began to think um, or reconsider some of the Euryptrids from the Canadian uh, Manitoban uh, Lagerstatten. Uh, and so this is uh, one of the uh, Euryptrids from Manitoba. And when you compare it uh, to uh, the Chasmataspidid Hoplitaspis, uh, you can see some interesting similarities. So um, the head is pushed back here, but you can see these legs are really thick and very spiny, just like here. You can see it's got the paddle. But then you get to just behind the head and you can see three body segments and you can see this single fused up plate which is just what you can see here. So these have been misidentified and these Manitoba specimens aren't Euryptrids at all. These are also gigantic Asmataspidids. I'm not sure if they're the same species, um, but they are probably very closely related. And given that um, these are uh, roughly uh, the same aged deposits, it would make sense. The interesting thing is that normally when we find uh, Euryptrids, like you get different species in different basins, uh, this would indicate that these things were fairly widespread in the Ordovician, which would be very unusual and, and pretty exciting in its own right. Uh, and so we have got so many specimens that we're able to really reconstruct um, this animal in a way that we haven't been able to do so for other Chasmataspidids. Uh, and so we've been able to completely reconstruct uh, the appendages at the head. Um, it's got a weird structure to its paddles. It's got a, a sort of kink in them. So they seem to project forwards and then kink backwards uh, in a way that um, actually makes sense and explains some of the things we're seeing in uh, some of the other Chasmataspidids. But the other thing as well is that the uh, sort of digital sort of bit at the end, the, the, the podomit at the end of the leg is sort of pushed um, forwards uh, which is very unusual and it's very unlike the Euryptrid paddles. The other thing that's missing is that Euryptrid paddles have um, a, an ancillary um, structure um, uh, that we call Potomir 7a that sort of makes the paddle much wider at the back and that appears to be missing here. Uh, and when you compare this leg to the Euryptrid paddles and you align up the different leg segments uh, you can actually homologize this to what's going on in the limbs of Chasmataspis. Uh, and so what seems to be happening is we're seeing Chasmataspidids independently develop a paddle for swimming, just like the Euryptrids do. So in Euryptrids, they subdivide um, this, uh, this podomy here. You can see that Chasmataspidids don't, they keep it, keep it solid. Um, but then this um, append, this, um, the, this, this podomy here widens up and then they develop, they modify a spine um, to basically uh, give them a lot more flexibility because the paddle can then move in and out of this spine. And it basically gives, allows them to sort of change the um, surface area of their paddle. Chasmataspidids do something similar. And we've known this for a while, but they do it on the front of the paddle rather than the back. And it's what I think is happening is that this is actually the modified um, potomy at the end of the leg. Um, and the, the paddle is actually the heavily inflated second bit of this chelate limb in Chasmataspis. So basically the fixed finger just inflates out and then the movable finger just moves up. Uh, and we can actually see it moves up and then it starts getting broader and broader. Um, and then the other thing you can see is that uh, this um, weird kink um, that these things develop um, is actually maintained in the appendage, we actually find them sticking out at slightly weird angles. Um, so 
this has really filled in a lot of gaps is how you get from this kind of metastasis-like form to these Silurian and Devonian diploastid-like forms. And it really puts to rest the idea that these forms are weird Eurypterids. They've, they've come about this independently. They've, they've independently developed this panel. Uh, and so what this means is that Casmetaspidids, while being a relatively um, small uh, group, actually are very, very diverse. And so we've got a, a wide variety of morphologies um, and they seem to be um, filling a wide variety of ecological roles, either as uh, predators or probably um, sort of semi infernal um, scavengers and, and shell crackers like horseshoe crabs uh, to, to maybe slightly more generalist forms. The other thing um, that the three dimensionality that I mentioned where the fact that all of this sediment has filled in these malts and sort of kept them three dimensional uh, has allowed us to do is to sort of dissect through some of them. So for the first time we've gotten a good look at just what is happening on this plate behind the head. It actually extends up into the middle of the head, which is very weird. It sort of goes in between um, the back appendages and, and the top. Uh, and so this is where the paddle is. And then this is how far up this plate extends. Uh, and the other thing that's really interesting about it is that it sort of has this notch at the front. And we can see it every time we, we get it preserved and get the front preserved. And so this is actually, an indication that some other things that we've found um, and have interpreted as, as sort of weird arthropods are actually kind of fantastic. It's particularly um, this uh, creature here, uh, which I, I described with my PhD advisor, Paul Selden back in uh, 2013 as a horseshoe crab. This is from the Devonian of, of China. Uh, and then in 2015, we found more specimens with this gigantic plate which at the time we interpreted as a very, very big feeding plate in metastome when we said, oh, this is potentially uh, an ancestral form to, to Eurypterids. But now when you compare this to what we're finding um, in uh, Hoplotaspis, this looks very much like the same plate and we're only seeing this from the underside. So what it looks like is that this is potentially the underside of this buckler and this is actually another Casmetaspidid. Um, and we just didn't realize. Um, and so uh, that's interesting. And so by getting a better idea of what these animals look like, we're now starting to uh, be able to reinterpret some other organisms um, and other species that we haven't really um, had a good idea of what they were before. Uh, and so that's the uh, most common arthropod, that's Hoplotaspis. Uh, we also have uh, a number of uh, Eurypterids. Um, we have at least two species. Um, we have one form that we only really have isolated appendages of. Um, it's got a very characteristic uh, ornamentation. It's got these um, lines of um, scales running up the legs. Uh, we also have uh, a tail spine. So this is the last segment. And then this is the, the talson at the back here. Again, preserved on the side at the side, which is really unusual for Eurypterids. And again, this is because all this silt is pushing into um, these shed exoskeletons. Uh, and the exciting thing about this is that it has a paddle, but it is a real, it's, it's got this gangly teen look about it. It's got this really unusually long leg attached to this paddle. And what this indicates is that this is an early offshoot of Eurypterids when they were developing the paddle. So this is something that's happening very, uh, this is something that's we've caught very early on in the paddle evolution, which would make sense because this is from the Ordovician. Uh, and so most Eurypterids, when they develop their paddles, begin to shorten up these um, segments at the top of the leg. So they sort of fuse them together and they just use them for rotation. Walking forms will move them back and forth and there's a lot more flexibility to it. Uh, and so when they're in the midst of developing the paddle, they, they broaden the end of the leg, but they keep the sort of walking portion at the top. And that's what we're seeing here. So it looks like we're finding something that's um, sort of around this stage of the paddle evolution. And so what it looks like from the leg is that we might have something uh, a bit similar to either Onycopterella, uh, which we have some Ordovician forms also known from the Silurian, particularly um, uh, of uh, Kokomo, 
which has some truly spectacular uh, fossils. Um, the the eruptions from there are amazing. Uh, and these other weird early um, forms like Rudimaniptrus, uh, which this is pretty much the only specimen known of it, but it has a very similar structure to its paddle. The thing that's interesting is that the limbs at the front it also have very long spines. Um, and so it looks a bit more like something like Dolichopterus. The thing that's interesting is when you have spines on a leg and you're trying to catch a prey, you want the spines to point towards you so that you're um, sort of grabbing something and pulling it in. These spines are pointing outwards, they're pointing the wrong way, which suggests that maybe this was uh, just like raking through the sediment looking for stuff rather than actively like pulling stuff into its mouth. Um, so this is something that's probably almost certainly a new species um, and we're sort of looking for some more material, but we will be uh, hopefully describing this um, fairly shortly. The other type of Eurypterid we have uh, is uh, another predatory form, and this looks a lot more similar to uh, a group called uh, Carcinosomatids, which have these really big discoidal bodies, most of them, um, and really um, heavily armed appendages. Uh, this is a really cool individual. You can see there's some um, segmentation down the side of the body here. You've got a paddle and then you've got a single leg, which has got these great big spines on it. And we have a number of these. We've got some showing the underside as well. So this is what the underside of the, the head looks like. Uh, and then we've got some isolated legs, which are again, really thick and robust. Uh, and then we've got some forms which preserve quite a lot of the original cuticle. Uh, and again, you've got a paddle here um, and the start of a head shield, but this is sort of all flaking away. Uh, however, I'm not entirely sure if these are one species or two. And so these specimens here look a lot like uh, this creature, which is called Lanocopterus. Um, this is known from the Silurian of Scotland. Uh, and the thing that really um, reminds me about Lanocopterus for this is not just the paddle, which looks fairly similar, although a bit different. So this would probably be a new, new genus or species that's quite closely related to Lanocopterus. Um, but you can just about see on the body here, there are, there's a groove running down the side. It's easiest to see here, but you can just about see a ridge. Um, and that is the same as what's going on here. So this is why this looks a lot like Lanocopterus to me, and then it's got the very long, thin um, back end of the body and then the tail spine. These forms look a bit more like uh, this creature here, which is Pentacopterus. This is from Winnesheek. Uh, and this is the oldest described Eurypterid so far. This is also uh, a Carcinosomatid, um, but this is we only know um, from fragments of cuticle because this could get quite large. The reason why this reminds me a bit of Pentacopterus is that this leg um, has an interesting um, sort of, you can see a, a sort of weird joint here between this segment and this segment. That looks a bit like this joint to me. Uh, and this leg is also pretty robust, so I th th these limbs look fairly similar to me. And then the other thing is that this paddle is odd. This paddle is very long, uh, and then here you've got a, a thinner segment, and then there's this weird bulge, uh, and then another segment here. And this looks a bit like what's going on with these paddles here. Uh, so this would be this segment. So this is this is the top of the paddle and this is towards the bottom. This is the top, this is towards the bottom. And these have this weird segment that just is uh, sort of a lobe that sticks out. And I think that might be what we have here. So it might be that we actually have two species of predatory eruptrid here. We've got something that looks a bit more like Pentacopterus and something that looks a bit more like Lanocopterus, but they'd both be in the same group, um, which is interesting because it would suggest that this, this group of predatory eurypterids was some of the first um, to really become successful. Eurypterids really take off in the Silurian, but um, these predatory forms might have done quite well in the Ordovician. Uh, the other thing that we um, did do, because we have this cuticle, is we looked at it under scanning electron microscope, um, because one thing that not many people know is that some arachnids um, will fluoresce underneath ultraviolet light. Anybody that owns scorpions uh, generally is, is familiar with this and people that uh, study them certainly know this um, because scorpions like to come out at night and it's much safer if you can see them. Uh, so uh, they'll go around with UV lights and get them to fluoresce. 
Horseshoe crabs also do this. Um, and uh, this is something that, that was known to photographers and a number of other people, but is, was not in the scientific literature. So we wanted to document that uh, and see um, if they're threatened the same way. And so what we did was we um, took sections of cuticle from um, modern forms. These are scorpions up here. This is a horseshoe crab. Um, and all of the uh, horseshoe crabs and scorpion fluoresce have a what we call a hyaline layer, which is a thin glassy layer underneath the top of the cuticle that seems to be storing um, fluorescent compounds from the, the, the blood of the animal. Uh, and the other arachnids that don't fluoresce don't have this. Um, they're missing this sort of HX layer. So we um, first of all tried to see if we could get any of these eurypterids to fluoresce and we couldn't, uh, which isn't surprising if they're taking compounds up from the blood that would probably sort of degrade over time and the fossilization process would probably completely obliterate whatever those compounds were. But we did look at the cuticle and it's real badly compressed, um, but you can just about see um, a very, very faint dividing line here, which might be the, the joint between the epicuticle at the top and then this hyaline layer. So we interpret this as suggesting that Eurypterids would have actually fluoresced if there was an ultraviolet light source strong enough, which there probably wouldn't have been. But they have this same structure that scorpions and horseshoe crabs have, which is interesting. And it's only because of the style of preservation at Big Hill that we've been able to tell this. Um, and so the other um, uh, calistrate we have is a horseshoe crab. And I did not believe this is a horseshoe crab for the longest time. Um, I only saw pictures of it and I kept saying, you sure it's not a Stylophora and are you sure it's not some kind of echinoid, uh, some kind of echinoderm. Uh, and then I saw the specimens and was like, oh no, it is a horseshoe crab. Um, here's the body. This is the, the sh ridiculously shaped head. Um, this is unusually um, long. Um, you've got the eyes here. Um, and the body looks just like Lunataspis um, from Manitoba, but the head shield is completely different. So we think this is a very closely related form, um, but it looks unlike any other horseshoe crab we've ever found. And so we're actively um, working on this. Um, the exciting thing about this is it means that horseshoe crabs are being very experimental early on in their evolution. Um, and then have sort of canalized into the, the body form that we're used to uh, today. Um, so we only have two specimens of this, it's really rare, um, but this might actually be um, one of the more exciting uh, finds out of Big Hill. Uh, and so the last thing that I, I wanted to mention um, is this creature that I showed you very early on, this, what we call a diplotergite arthropod. Um, this has got multiple segments, uh, and the reason we say it's diplotergite is because we've got the middle broken away, uh, and on the edge here you can see this is one segment, one body segment, but in the middle it's two. Uh, and this is something that you see in millipedes and centipedes, where there'll be two pairs of legs per body segment, and this is because um, on the, the, the top side these two segments have merged together. And that seems to be what's happening here. Now there are a number of Cambrian arthropods that do this as well, so we're not entirely sure um, what this could be. We're missing the head, which is very frustrating. But it does look very similar to Pelimarachne, which is this creature that was described from Manitoba as a pycnogonid or sea spider. Uh, and the interpretation of this was that you've got this head region up here, and this is where the uh, appendages would have, uh, the, the claws and the head would have fit in. And then this is the body, and then these are the bases of legs. Uh, and so they have this specimen here, and they say this is the part that we have preserved, and this is uh, to make it or fit into looking like a pycnogonid. The trouble is, these are broken, and so this angle that these are coming off that is not natural. Um, these are what we call articulating facets, which means that they are for segments to overlap and articulate with one another, which picnic owners don't do because they're basically just um, a, a sock puppet that just has wrinkles in it. Um, and then there's a lot more of it back here, which is kind of ignored. Uh, and so I strongly suspect that this, that Payamarachne is the same thing as whatever this is. Um, and so it, um, I'd be interested to get to look at the material of this to compare with this, so we can try to work out exactly what these things are. Uh, so 
that sort of covers the basis of all four of the aquatic glycerate groups. We've got a horseshoe crab, we have a casmataspidid, we've got several eurypterids, and we don't have a pycnogonid, um, which has been interpreted as such um, from the Canadian um, Lagerstatt. So yeah, just to, to conclude, um, Big Hill preserves this really odd lagoonal marine habitat, but it's really interesting to see these more shallow marine environments preserved from this time period. And it really is very, very similar to the localities we have in Manitoba, um, to the extent where uh, we can start to uh, directly compare between the two um, and uh, refine some of our interpretations uh, based off that. Um, the number of chalicerates for a single locality is astounding. It's very diverse. It's very rare that we're going to get Cadmataspidids and Eurypterids and horseshoe crabs all together. In fact, this might be the only locality where we find all three uh, together. Um, and as you can probably tell, there's a lot more work to be done. Um, so uh, we've got uh, more publications uh, forthcoming. Um, and so stay tuned for us finally getting around to describing the various Eurypterids uh, and the horseshoe crab. Uh, so yeah, that's that. If anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to to talk more. Uh, yes, um, the uh, what is it? The Big Hill Formation mm -hmm. is that at the top of the Canyon of uh, of Michigan? Yes, yeah. It's there's literally just above it. There's an unconformity, and then you've got Silurian sediments. Is there any Hernanchian uh, above that, or that seems to have been weathered away as far as okay. at least at least um, on the pin uh, where it is here. There might be uh, an engine elsewhere, but we haven't found it. Okay. And last thing, I'm not sure that all of the nautiloids are the same. That's. I saw you shaking your head. That's very fair. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. This is right. Uh, nautiloids are not my uh, my my specialty. I'll go back to them for a second. Actually. Okay. Um, uh, and there have been um, some nautiloids have been described from other sediments within the formation, and they've all been placed within one species that is a known wastebasket taxon. Yeah. Um, Actually, two of them look more, I hate to say it, but two of them look more Silurian mm -hmm. than Ordovician. The, the, uh, uh, but the one that has the striations on the, the plate that has double. Uh, looks like Kynosterus, and the one that has the annulations looks like Dawsonosterus. Mm -hmm. Now, there are Ordovician taxa that are very similar, uh, and there is Kynosterus in the Ordovician too, but um, so you could have Gorbiosterus here, you could have Proteosterus, which is probably what uh, the second one on the double plate is, um, and um, oh, what else is there? Um, oh, Monmuchides. Mm -hmm. The one with the annulations could be a muted Monmuchides or an Anasporoceros. Okay, okay. This is very interesting. Okay. I've, I, I've been shopping pictures around to various um, uh, cephalopod workers, and no one, nobody's interested in, in, in working on it. It's very, it's a little bit frustrating, actually. I think because. <laughs> It's, it's just an occurrence as far as a lot of them are concerned, so. <laughs> well, Bob, Bob Fry at, uh, well, he's, he's working uh, for the Ohio Department of Health. Bob Fry might be able to help a bit more. He's more used to the uh, upper uh, Ordovician nautiloids than I am. We've been, we've been working on, on a paper on the, the uh, Platteville stuff, but uh, he might be able to, you know, again, that's not the focus of your, of your work. And, um, yeah, these the the straight nautiloids are the least well done of any of them. It's just really frustrating. But mm -hmm. anyway, that's it. No, this that's really useful. Thank you. I think I scared everybody away. <laughs> I like to say that uh, this um, site reminds me of the birdie than the Williamsville. I'm from Buffalo. So right right across the river is the Fort Erie uh, place. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm hearing an echo here. Somebody must have turned their mic on and probably needs to turn it off until they talk. Ah, there we go. I'll try to mute myself and see if that helps. 
I mean, it, uh, okay, it sounds good now. Um, I mean, it's, it's really remarkable that it, it's, you know, from the Slurian and Ordovician that you have uh, this wide variety of uh, uh, different types of arthropods in um, horseshoe, you know, with the, with the horseshoe crabs, it's same thing. Um, do you, do you find any, uh, uh, Ordovician worms at all in this, uh, site? No, and that's, it would be really interesting to get more out of it like that, but we haven't found, or at least I haven't seen, um, Jerry had a lot of other stuff that was slowly being prepped out, so we'll see if anything comes up. Um, but yeah, there's not much in the way of, um, other truly soft-bodied forms, which is, definitely interesting if you're going to draw the comparison between say the Bertie where you do get that kind of stuff. I, I wonder if at some point in preservation this was vaguely, I don't know, as I said like when you're looking at the the um, more aragonitic stuff it, it's it's been badly beaten up and I wonder if there was at some point during the entire process of this turning into rock um, we ended up with either slightly acidic or, or something happening that has meant that we've lost aspects of the fauna. What about juvenile, um, like an ontogeny? Uh, at Birdie, we, we, we have that as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you find that there? Uh, so we do actually have um, some of the juvenile of the Casmataspidids. Um, they are almost looking like small versions of the adults, but it, it's very interesting because um, I actually have a um, juvenile Casmataspis, which, which was actually described with the original paper uh, and then ignored ever since, uh, that looks just like the juveniles of, of this species. So I think that this species has come about by retaining juvenile characteristics into adulthood. Uh, and that explains really why the other Casmataspids don't look anything like the original one, uh, because they've just retained a bunch of juvenile characteristics. Um, so yeah, we do have some of that. For the Eryptrids, um, we, we definitely have some, but they're much more fragmentary, and so it's difficult to, to draw many conclusions from that. I was, wondering, I was wondering when this site was actually discovered. That is a good question. Um, so I know Ron and Jerry had access to it, what would it have been? Around about 2013, at least. Um, there were also reports of a similar fauna from Wisconsin that was found before that, um, that I have been desperately trying to find out sort of where that was and um, uh, that stuff was being collected in the mid 2000s uh, and it has transpired recently because um, Ron was talking to the, uh, to the gentleman that was um, that had them but it's actually the same locality he was just saying Wisconsin because he was he was being very cagey and <laughs> didn't want uh, others finding it so it's so um, various people have known about this from I think the early 2000s um, but uh, Ron and Jerry started working with me on, working with me on it in uh, about 2015. It's still very young. We have no evidence yet of other sites similar to that towards the East Coast? Not that I'm aware of. I think it would be very interesting, especially because this is so similar to what we're finding up in Canada. Like there's, there's got to be just a band of it, I, I think, that just would originally have stretched across most of this, this half of the continent. It'd be really interesting to just, you know, look for outcrops that you know that we're around this age and see if we find anything. But, um, but yeah, I don't think anything, anybody's found anything yet. Um, I just wanted to pass along Dave's apologies to you. His computer went south. It sounds like he might be back up, but uh... Uh, normally he does the introductions, which is a lot better than what I was able to do it <laughs> in short notice, sorry. Do you find salt hoppers in this locality? Um, we have a couple. 
um, they are occurring more towards the top um, rather than um, in the main section where we're finding this stuff. So it does look like we maybe are shallowing out and getting more saline towards the top of the section and then it's sort of cut off by this unconformity. I have a comment that I, 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 I kind of thought that we had a paper by uh, Jerry Gunderson. Um, uh, James, you might not, you probably don't know, but uh, um, I do the editing for the MAPS Expo Digest. And uh, we have um, themed expo session. It's, it's, a, it's the largest fossil show in, in probably in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're holding it at Springfield this year. Well, obviously 2020, uh, it wasn't held because of, of COVID. Uh, but before that, Jerry, uh, I think obviously before he, uh, before he passed, but uh, he sent me a paper on that, uh, um, uh, the discovery of a late order of Lagerstadt in 2013. And he talks about him and Ron Meyer uh, uh, looking at stuff back in the 1980s. So okay. this is probably, I'm sorry. I, I was just saying. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, you know, you may not be familiar with this. If you if you want, um, you know, uh, give me your email and I can send you a copy of that paper. Okay. And it will be published in the uh, and and obviously, I'll, uh, you know, when did when did Jerry pass? Um, around January. Uh -huh. I'm I'm sorry about that. So um, I'll, need to, I'll need to put uh, deceased on the thing then, but wow, that's, anyway. Um, yeah, give me your email and I can send you that just to, you know, just to, uh, uh, to have you aware sure. of what he's, uh, of what he did. That'd be great, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, whenever I talked to Jerry, he uh, was more interested in, in talking, showing the fossils and talking about the fossils. And so it wasn't always easy to, uh, uh, <laughs> Pin him down to like talk about the history of everything. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, go back to the uh, brachiopod. Can yeah. we look at the brachiopod? Right, yeah. So uh, the one in the upper left hand corner there, I've seen that pattern before. And before, I've always just assumed it was like that little segment from a, uh, like a trilobite, that part on the very top of it there. And uh, uh -huh. so now I find out it's a brachiopod. That's that's very interesting. What what view of a brachiopod is that? Is that like a, a, a cross section, or is that like an open brachiopod? We're looking at the inside. Uh, and it's it's partly sort of eroded away. Um, this is this is a very large one. A lot of them are sort of a bit smaller and preserve more of the the sort of outside of it. I think this is partly a cross section. So we've sort of probably got the the edge, and then we've sort of cut through the middle a bit. Yeah. Uh, this this might be. Well, it's if it's a lingulate, that shouldn't be a pedicle. But, uh, but yeah, there's obviously bits of it that are sort of come off that are on one side, um, and not the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you showed at least two of them that are like that. Yeah, there's a. Um, yeah, this is the same specimen in different lighting. And then this is a close up of the other, um, what we what we interpret as other for as, as a different form, um, but this is so much larger that potentially could be the same thing if it changes as it grows. But... Okay, thank you. Are you familiar with uh, Richard Lobb's uh, publication on pteragodids that they weren't really uh, like a fierce predator, that they were more like a scavenger? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, when you were talking about those, um, um, I don't know what you want to call them, you had a name for them, like the, the spines coming off the, the legs that were pointing forward. Mm -hmm. uh, does that kind of fall into his thinking? Um, so the thing with the pterygotids is their their chelicerae, which are the actually the part of the, the mouth parts. Um, let's see uh, the underside, the reconstruction. 
part of this. Yeah, the, so they just extend, they, they, they just make these really huge. And so they're actually um, a claw. So there's gonna be like something at the top that stops them from just raking through stuff in the same way that you could do um, with this sort of appendage. Um, the, I think the difference is that um, like these appendages, while they're very spi spiny, aren't going to be for like cracking open anything. They're going to be for like catching and pulling in. Whereas the 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 pterygotid claws have been interpreted as maybe puncturing down on, on stuff. And so um, he was arguing with with Acuda Ramis in particular that that the slant is just not good for that. Um, some of the other pterygotids do have like much thicker teeth and maybe could have done it. I think um, one of the one of the things that we do a little bit too much sometimes with things like pterygotids is we uh, assume that every species has the same exact ecology and there's probably a bit of variation going on amongst them uh, as well. So. If only we could see one in action, right? Yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd be very interesting. You can do a thing called uh, a method called finite element analysis, which is basically just building a digital model and um, modeling um, various stresses and strains based off the properties of what the material would have been. I think it'd be fascinating to do that with um, pterygotus claws and see exactly what it could or could not do. What do you think the... Um purpose of, of the, uh, uh, I don't know what you would call it at the very end of this animal that we're looking at right here. Uh, was it basically uh, to help it flip back on its, uh, uh, like if it, if it was flipped, uh, do you think that they used it like a horseshoe crab would be to flip it back itself upright again? Yeah, I'm, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. Um... Roy Plotnick um, looked at the like the, the back end of pterygotids and sort of suggested that they um, acted as a rudder um, and the long body probably also would have generated some sort of lift. Um, there were there was musculature uh, in this. In fact, this was probably mostly just gut and muscle, um, and so there might have been a bit of upwards and downwards motion it could have done. Um, but yeah, it, it's. It's not entirely clear exactly uh, what they'd have been doing, but yeah, probably helping right itself, keep it stable, especially if it's swimming. Um, there would have been some motion there. I mean, you can sort of see with this this fossil here that there is a bit of, it was able to curve itself a bit, so. Thank you. Any more questions? Is a horse, well, go ahead. I was just asking if there were more questions. Oh yeah, uh, is a horseshoe crab? Is that actually not a crab? Is is it like? Uh, I mean, is is horseshoe crab? Is the crab part more of a nickname? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, there was actually back in the nineteen hundreds. Um, they we even thought that uh, we thought Euryprids were crustaceans as well, um, and then. Uh, Ray Lancaster wrote, basically dissected a horseshoe crab and basically said, oh, it's, it's um, the arterial system and the heart and everything like that is basically like that of a scorpion. Um, and so um, that realization and, and realizing that uh, the, the horseshoe crabs are more closely related to arachnids um, is, was sort of set us down the path of, of our modern understanding of, of arthropod relationships. Um, and explains a lot of things with with Euryprids as well because previously people were trying to figure out where the antennae were and of course there weren't any because they're not they're not crustaceans um so yeah the the horseshoe crabs are it's just a uh, an accident it's, it's an unfortunate name that stuck because we now know better but hey james mm -hmm. this is uh this is rob coleman um We've talked a couple of times. I showed you some of the uh, material originally from what was supposedly the Wisconsin site. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I do have, a, a, I believe, a polycate worm from that site, and I'd be happy to send it to you if, um, if you'd like me to. So I, I can touch base with you offline, and we can talk about that. Sure, that sounds great. 
great great talk by the way yeah no good to good to hear from you yep <laughs> take care you too any more questions i guess not uh, I'd, I'd like, like oh you oh, do don yeah, uh, this is Don Cronar. I'm one of the people who edits the newsletter. Uh, James, could you put together a few slides and uh, a couple pages of text and kind of summarize the talk for a newsletter? Um, sure. Yeah, I can. I can do that. I'd appreciate it. Well distribute to the members and you know there's a couple hundred people who belong to the club so to speak and uh i'm always asking all the speakers for this and then i keep reminding them for months and months and months <laughs> to do it so i'll I, start today okay I, I i will not promise that i'll be better but i will certainly try <laughs> okay uh I assume that Dave Carlson has your email address. Mm -hmm. And rather than my trying to ask for it now, uh, let me get it from Dave and I'll, I'll drop you a note. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank you very much for your talk. It was fascinating. Very good. I wish it was a place that we all could go to. <laughs> Thanks again, James. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, thanks for having me. It's been it's been Thank great. you. Uh, Thank it's you. very good. Appreciate it. Two thumbs up. I'm ending the recording. <laughs>